I just saw your messages. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, looks like now everything is working. Okay, can you see my presenter view or the? No, I see the full screen view. Good, good, good. So it's it's all um, great. And um, I'm gonna try to set up a separate meeting so we catch up. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been a while. And we don't get to catch up at conferences anymore, right? So. <laughs> now we're both too busy. If we were on a board together, that would that would work. But we we for whatever reason we end up not being on the boards at the same time. Company boards or academic yeah, boards. Those or society boards. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, we will change that. Yeah. Well, I'll ask Samantha. Uh, I think she's on. Samantha, can you set up a meeting with Steve and I? Yes, definitely. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go in the background. Mehmet is going to be taking over soon. Um, and uh, we usually stay a few, like, a few minutes after the hour before we start because people come in, um, you know, a little late typically, but, um, um, you know, should be all good. Sounds good. Awesome. Should I get started? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Terasaki seminar series. Today we have Professor Steve Little from uh, University of Pittsburgh. He is the distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering, as well as William Kepler, Whiteford and Doc Professor in the Departments of Bioengineering, Pharmaceutical Sciences, Immunology, Ophthalmology, and the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. He received his PhD in chemical engineering from MIT in 2005. He has published more than 100 papers and has two spin out companies which are located in Pittsburgh. His uh, many awards, more than five, uh, 50 national and international awards, including Curtis Macro Research Award from ASEE, is a fellow of BMES, CRS, AI, MBE. He has three Carnegie Science Awards, Society for Biometrics Young Investigator Award. Again, many, many awards, and he stands as the only individual in university history to receive all three 
Chancellor's Distinguished Awards. He's recently been named one of the Pittsburgh magazines for the under 40, a fast tracker by the Pittsburgh Business Times, and is also one of only five individuals in Pittsburgh who are reshaping our world by Pop City Media. The floor is yours, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much. Um, let me know if you'd like me to turn on my video feed. It says the uh, host. Totally, has... totally up to you. Okay. I, I can't start it because it says the host has stopped it. You can try that again. Okay. Now it's on. Great. All right. Well, uh, let me say thanks to um, Ali and thanks to uh, the board of the Turasaki Institute for inviting me to give this talk. Um, Ali and I have known each other since we were cutting our teeth, uh, doing PhDs uh, together in the lab. I have the highest respect for him and was very excited to see him join uh, the leadership of, of the Institute here. I actually do work in immunoengineering, as you can see. And recently we've been doing some work in transplantation, which I'm gonna finish this presentation off with. And I know that uh, the Institute has um, a, a, a rich history in, in transplantation and studying it. So I hope that the talk today is relevant. Just a little bit of um, orientation about where I am. So uh, I'm in Pittsburgh here, the Institute's in Cal Southern California, which is one of my favorite places on uh, planet Earth. Spent a little bit of time at, at Caltech uh, and I love the area. Uh, we're a long way away over here in Pittsburgh, PA. For those of you who are not in the States, I know this has an international audience. This just gives you some orientation uh, on, on the country. You zoom into Pittsburgh, this is, is Pittsburgh here, and you might notice uh, that there are three rivers that come together into this one spot. There's a lot of locations in Pittsburgh that are named after this spot, like Three Rivers Stadium uh, used to be, now has been renamed um, to Heinz Field and PNC Park are the, the parks. Uh, we have uh, mainly hockey, baseball, and, and uh, football. Uh, mainly football fans in, in uh, Pittsburgh, although some will favor hockey. Uh, this is the view from the top of Mount Washington. So you can see the three rivers from where we are. And this is the, 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 the downtown area. If you go back behind this downtown area is where all of the universities are, like the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. It's just a few of them. This is the University of Pittsburgh's campus. And uh, notably on this campus, there is at least one building uh, which is over in, in this direction that is very famous that is called the Cathedral of Learning, which is the tallest academic building, I believe, east of the Mississippi. And this is the Cathedral of Learning. And when you go inside of this cathedral, it sort of looks like Hogwarts. And I, I had a group picture taken inside of the cathedral, just so you can see. Um, I start my presentations and end my presentations with this group of people because uh, they're the ones that do all of this work. Uh, come up with most of these ideas and see them through completion. I'm just here to support them, give them money and uh, you know, try to get them connections and, and such. So uh, they're, they're really the brains behind everything that you're about to see today. I'm gonna start with controlled release, which is the area that we work in. Controlled release has advanced um, quite a bit here in, in recent years. Um, I'm showing just some examples of some things that are utilized for controlled release that are made out of degradable polymers, uh, which are the most common materials used for controlled release today. Uh, here's some particles that are approximately the same size of a cell, so around 10 microns. And you can load these guys with really anything that you would want to release them from small molecules to nucleic acids to, to proteins, peptides. Um, and you could imagine them releasing things kind of like a cell would secrete things. On the right-hand side here, you're seeing a tissue engineering matrix, which many of you probably are familiar with. Uh, you can make these a number of different ways. Um, you may have all kinds of materials, but these are made out of degradable polymers. And you could load these things and you could imagine uh, something inside of this matrix, like a cell, receiving a signal um, that would be similar to what it would receive if it was an extracellular matrix. Uh, and then you can make more complex structures, like something that looks like an organ or a vessel wall. Um, these uh, degradable porous hollow fibers were made um, by an extrusion process. And you can uh, see that there's both macro and micro porosity. And there's all kinds of engineering um, variables that you can tune in order to release things um, from these structures that resemble organ or vessels. 
Um, and you can uh, make other kinds of systems. This is just an example of how you can make systems that look very much like what you see in the body right now. Uh, when I was a graduate student at the same time as uh, Ali, uh, we were asked frequently to design control release systems for people, collaborators that would talk to my PhD advisor and say, will you please make something to release uh, what we have in a particular way? And uh, what I found is that, at least at the time, it was it was highly iterative um, process where you would guess and check and you would get all kinds of drug release profiles that were very hard to predict in terms of uh, what you were putting in and what you wanted to get out. I'm showing just a standard drug release profile with time and days on the x-axis, and this is arbitrary. You can imagine this could be days, it could be weeks, it could be uh, months, uh, or even years for that matter. And then cumulative release on the y-axis, which goes from 0, 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way up to 100% of what was encapsulated. And what I'm showing here is a rather complicated release profile with multiple phases. You see this sometimes, not all the time, but you see it sometimes. Uh, with phase one being a burst of drug that you put in, um, phase two being a lag, and then phase three, the onset of a second phase of release, and phase four being um, termination. Now, let me just make something clear. Phase one is when something comes out of the system really fast, which is sort of the opposite of control release or sustained release. Phase two is where nothing's coming out of the system for an extended period of time, which is the other opposite of control release and sustained release. So all the way up to phase three, we really don't have any uh, uh, control release. It's really only after that. Uh, and it makes it even more frustrating that you never know uh, at that point in time when you were gonna get all of these phases and when you weren't. What I wanted to do was be able to design a system like the ones that I will talk about later in this presentation with much more predictable release behavior based on things that I can control as an engineer, like the, the size of a particle radius or the size or, or, or thickness of um, an implant or um, a hollow fiber or something like that. Uh, microstructure inside of the system, the polymers you would use, you would know what the hydrolysis rate is, what starting molecular weight is, and you'd know things about the drug. And if you could put all of that in and know what the release profile was, that would be really, really helpful uh, to making things for people. When I became uh, assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh, I, I tried to decide to dive into this area because I struggled with it so much as a graduate student and found that um, I really was standing on giant shoulders. There's a lot of people that had looked at this problem to try to solve it. Going back to the 1980s, um, Nicholas Pepys um, came up with a power law that is still utilized widely today. Um, Himmelstein and Saltzman in the 80s and, and going into the 90s came up with the first mechanistic models of controlled release. With Mark Saltzman's model, believe it or not, uh, not really being in a manuscript that he wrote, uh, but being his thesis. So in other words, he kind of did this on the side <laughs> and it became some of this widely utilized theory at the time uh, uh, that was just in a thesis. Then in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, it was Akim Gopfrich and um, Jürgen Seatman that really came up with um, the more uh, useful models of what was going on uh, in the microstructure uh, over time in the microsphere, which I'll explain in a second, but these were Monte Carlo models, the stochastic models. Each of these things from uh, early on all the way to, to uh, in the 2000s were based on fixed second law. And this is a, a, a pretty familiar thing, especially to what would be bioengineers and chemical engineers. Um, with an effective diffusivity. And this effective diffusivity is really based on the porosity of the matrix. So I'm highlighting down here uh, with this purple circle. And what these Monte Carlo models did in the late 1990s and early 2000s was they, they uh, modeled how this porosity increased over time. In other words, they made the um, hypothesis and observations that uh, these systems did not degrade like you would imagine a salt crystal dissolves from the outside in. They really kind of degrade from the inside out with pores forming and coalescing and connecting inside. Um, interestingly enough, uh, for chemical engineers who are on this call, this might uh, make sense to you because uh, from basic chemical engineering principles, this is percolation. So uh, what I did with my students is apply some of that um, logic and use some modern fluorescent tools uh, that change fluorescence intensity uh, and wavelength based on um, uh, the pH in the system. What we did is we took the first pictures with color like this 
of a degrading microsphere. And you can see this microsphere started off as just a solid microsphere. Over time, you have some pores that are growing and then connecting with one another and ultimately providing a pathway for release of something out of the system. We created some mathematical models that I would be happy to talk to you guys another time uh, or individually at some time or send you papers. We utilized all of this in order to make some mathematical models, which at the time were the most broadly applicable mathematical models to date. They can uh, release, uh, predict release of a wide variety of things with different polymer molecular weights, different copolymer ratios. They worked um, for polyesters and, and polyanhydrides and different drugs that you would encapsulate. Most importantly, they were able to capture um, when and when you would not get these various phases of release, phase one burst release, phase two lag phase, phase three onset, and then the termination phase. They did a pretty good job of capturing those kinetics um, really for the first time. This is an extremely flexible model construct as I was describing. Um, it works for molecules less than 900 Daltons all the way up to things that are big proteins and even viruses. They work with different matrices, uh, different fabrication techniques, um, so it's not specific to any of these things. It, it, worked, it worked very broadly. We published this in two key papers. Uh, the one that's most uh, uh, cited is this one in biomaterials, uh, where we actually extended some of this thing to include mathematics related to the water penetration into the system. And that allowed us to predict release from uh, matrices that are known to be both bulk eroding, which I showed before. They degrade sort of from the inside out and also surface eroding where water penetration is somewhat limited and it degrades in a halo uh, and works its way in. Uh, so this model works for, for both of those things and you can check out these papers if you're interested or I'd be happy to correspond with you about um, how these work. What this ultimately did uh, was allow us to um, predict what the release profile would be based on these things that you have control uh, of as an engineer. And I'm showing down here on the right hand side my first chemical engineering graduate student, Sam Rothstein, who became the chief scientific officer of Chrono Inc., which is a company that utilizes this technology um, and now is actually the CEO of, of Chrono Inc. But what he does with this is the, the, the opposite. So a company will give him or an academic laboratory will give him a release profile for a particular drug. And then he takes that and, and puts it into the model and he spits out a recipe for how to make the formulation. And once you have that recipe, you can confirm whether or not it meets your release profile, which it, 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 it typically has done. And this company's made quite a bit of money um, doing this, which is, which is pretty exciting. And it's always great to see uh, students like this succeed with their own technology. So I do have to give a disclaimer because I did mention Chrono. Um, I, I will only mention it further by just saying that I do have a financial interest in the company. Um, so I just have to make sure that I disclose that. The other thing that these models do is it allows you to uh, realize different release behavior for the exact same polymer and the exact same drug as long as you know how to design the system. In other words, uh, some systems will give you burst lag burst behavior, but if you know how to tune it, you can take that same system and get linear release of the system. And, and that's exciting because sometimes you don't want to change the polymers to some new polymers that, for instance, would struggle to get FDA approval. You can use the same uh, polymers that are recognized as grass or generally recognized as safe by the FDA to get whatever release profile uh, you want, which is exciting. All right, so I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of this to prove that it works in some papers that we've published over the years. Um, this work was done with Lou Falo, who's the head of dermatology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and he makes vaccines. Um, he's had some exciting um, COVID vaccine uh, data here recently that's made the news. But at the time, uh, what we did was just show that if you were to take an Ova alum vaccine, which he utilizes in his models, uh, and you were to encapsulate, that it was possible uh, to basically take something that you would have to manually administer a prime and then wait until later to get a boost that you could basically program a system to do that automatically. Uh, and we took some data from uh, his, his model local uh, concentrations. And what we tried to do is say, well, if we were to take this blue line and give this to you, okay, so for this Ova Allen vaccine, we were to have half, exactly half of it come out at time zero, or at least over the first day, and then wait one week, 
and then release the second dose? Would that be helpful to you? So in today's modern terms, you can imagine that if you get like a Pfizer vaccine, um, you get one dose and then you have to wait uh, three weeks and then get a second one. But if you get a Moderna vaccine, you have to wait four weeks to get your next dose. So could we, for instance, design a system where we just give you one dose and then it releases half of it, waits inside of your body and then releases the other half. So what we did is we took this blue line, we plugged it into our model and it spit out a recipe for how to make this. And then what we did is we made it and checked the release profile and this is what we got. So this uh, red data shows that one half of it is released at the beginning, it waits seven days and then it releases the other half of the vaccine. So the title of this paper is really hiding and then revealing immunologic pay payloads in vivo. And this demonstrates that we can get this first bag lag burst behavior. The second example that I'll give you is for long-term delivery of something that you would want more linear release from, and this is uh, for glaucoma. So what uh, we did is we used this drug, bromonidine tartrate. It's an alpha-2 agonist. And what we wanted to get is this release behavior uh, between these two dotted lines, which uh, were based on this particular engineering design constraints of two to three daily dosing uh, with this concentration of the bromonidine tartrate drops, two drops of uh, Afghan, Afghan a day, which is the um, name brand of this drug, 1.5 mg per mil uh, of the drug, 50 microliter drop volume and one to 7% absorption. That gives us this window to one to 7% absorption. And using the model, we were able to sort of nail it almost right in the middle. Um, now, you would administer these two eyes and it's hard to administer drug in your eye if you're just putting particles. So we had another component that we created that was an acrylamide-based thermoresponsive hydrogel. And we're showing that at room temperature, this gel is liquid. We added some fluorescent dye to this so that you could see it. But when you were to give this to yourself as an eye drop under your eyelid here in the lower fornix and it were to touch uh, your body temperature, it would immediately gel and form this nice mucousy uh, sort of material that we'll show you here right now when we pull it out of the 37 degree fluid. And it can be retained underneath of your eyelid. You could imagine mixing particles inside of this and then gelling it as it uh, is administered in just a, a suspension to the eye. Uh, this is just a color added um, SEM showing that these particles are embedded inside of the gel. And what we did is we used rabbits. Uh, these rabbits are not anesthetized at all. Uh, so they're perfectly fine with this. We just lift their eyelid, we add the drop. And as you can see, the gel will just sit nicely down in what's called the lower fornix of the eye. And these rabbits don't mess with the eye. They leave it there. They actually forget that it's in their, their eye over time. And what we're showing in this next slide is just that it's retained for an entire 28 days. It doesn't come out. If you wanted to remove it, you can just apply a cold pack or uh, flush the eye out with um, some cold saline and it'll come right out. Uh, we published this data showing that administration of bromonidine tartrate drops over a 28 day period of time kept um, intraocular pressure low, which is our primary endpoint for glaucoma, um, whereas our control in the white was higher, which you would expect uh, in the system. But one administration of a gel drop at the beginning for the entire 28 days, uh, sorry about that, gives you the same result as going in every day, twice a day, and giving brownie and tartrate drops. Uh, and this was published in Nature Scientific Reports. And I'm gonna skip this data here in the interest of time. This work was published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they did an article on us. Um, Ann Lucas, who doesn't work for the Wall Street Journal, uh, was interested in this because she actually has glaucoma. And because she travels so much in the dangers of forgetting her eye drops, uh, she actually has to go in and get um, uh, injections into her eye uh, for, for glaucoma medication on a regular basis. So she was particularly interested in the possibility of this technology. Uh, which we're now trying to commercialize through one of our companies um, called Otero Therapeutics. This is Morgan Fedorchek who, who did the work that I just described to you and Joel Schumann who's now at NYU uh, who's a world expert on glaucoma.
So these are just two examples of how you can design uh, a number of different things with linear release profiles or burst like burst profiles uh, using some of the engineering technology that I described you earlier, modeling of control release. What I'm gonna do now is transition here into the next part of my talk, um, which is uh, more along the lines of immunoengineering. What we're doing with these formulations is really imitating certain things that we see inside of the body using these release profiles, like I alluded to earlier on in this talk. And this was an article that was done on our group um, called When Medicine Imitates Life. And I, I like to think sometimes in my pitch sometimes to my students is that the way that we do this is, is make engineered solutions that in one small way uh, imitate the life that we're trying to save. The example that I'll give you here today is um, with tumors. Um, I love the title of this talk. It's, it's called Fatal Attraction, Tumors Beckon Regulatory T-Cells. Um, I love how scientists anthropomorphize biology like this because we realize that uh, biology is uh, smarter than just some cells in a dish. Uh, what they found in this paper, which was published in 2004, it was the year before I graduated uh, MIT with my PhD, that there are uh, tumor cells that release this protein called CCL22. And what it does is it binds to a chemokine receptor called uh, CCR4 that is overexpressed on cells called regulatory T cells. And it makes them localize and enrich in the area of the tumor and effectively serves as an immunoevasion strategy uh, that tumors use. These are regulatory T cells um, from a pa uh, paper of a collaborator of mine, Dario Vignali, uh, in uh, the Department of Immunology at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, these T regs are able through both soluble um, contact independent mechanisms and contact dependent mechanisms of powerfully regulating and decreasing uh, inflammatory responses and, and, and immune responses if they so believe that they should in an area. And the balance of these cells and effector cells is really important. So if you have an overabundance in an area of Th1 or Tc1 uh, effector cells over Tregs, you have inflammation. And if that happens chronically, you can have disease, inflammatory disease or re immune rejection. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're seeing if you have a um, larger amount of Treg, at least proportionally to effector cells, uh, or uh, proportionally to the number of Treg that would be present in an inflammatory environment, you have tolerance. And this is how uh, locally these guys function. So in the absence of Tregs, you have exacerbated inflammation. And when you infuse Tregs, or you, in, like we are going to show you, enrich them in a local site, you have reduced inflammation. Tumors utilize this by, as I said, secreting CCL22, leading to a spatial gradient, which is really important that you maintain the spatial gradient because this spatial information is critical for the cells to know where to go to localize to the tumor cells. And then regulatory T cells will home to the local site. And what was interesting in this paper by Tyler Curiel, um, who I believe is at the University of Texas Southwestern now, uh, is that if you block this or knock out the ability to, uh, of tumors to um, release CCL22, the immune system will reject uh, the tumors, which I think is really interesting. So we asked the question, if tumors can do this, why can't we? If we can design a control release system to mimic the secretion of CCL22 in the same amount and also including that spatial information, can we enrich regulatory T cells at a local site of inflammation for any number of things? including several that I'll show you today, like transplantation, can we affect uh, the rejection or uh, destructive inflammation uh, in that local area and potentially utilize this as a, as a new treatment? Uh, so these are the microspheres that we created and designed to release CCL22. Given the size of the protein, what it wants to do is come out in bursts, but we were able to utilize our methods in order to make it come out very smoothly over this period of time, which is important for maintaining uh, that spatial information at a local site of implantation. And we published these results in advanced materials. What we did is we injected luminescent regulatory T cells and fluorescent microspheres. And on one side, we injected microspheres that were blank and didn't secrete anything. On the other side, we injected microspheres that released CCL22 
And what we did is we showed that the luminescent regulatory T cells were actually home to one site, uh, one side over the other uh, in this paper. And this is Sid Junjunwala, uh, who is now a faculty member in, in India, uh, was a bioengineering student and, and one, of the, one of the best students uh, that, that I've ever had. We also have come up with other ways to enrich regulatory T cells in a local site besides that, mimicking uh, this guy up here, which is called a tolerogenic dendritic cell. It secretes interleukin-2 to some degree and also TGF-beta-1, and it utilizes that to transform naive T cells into uh, FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. So what we did is we created microspheres that are um, designed to mimic the way that these uh, dendritic cells release these factors. And we also included a, a third microsphere that releases a molecule called rapamycin that is utilized in order to maintain uh, uh, an immunosuppressive microenvironment. So these three microspheres, T, R, I, we called tri-microspheres. So there's three of them and it's TGF beta rapamycin IL-2. And we also published this work showing that we can uh, more powerfully induce FOXP3 positive regular T regulatory T cells than we had seen done in the literature to date. Over 80% uh, regulatory T cells from a population of naive um, cells using all three of these microspheres and, and demonstrated that um, really all three of them are, are needed in order to get that powerful uh, of, of, of um, differentiation into T regs. So in summary, the mechanisms here, one that I showed you was a local implantation of a chemokine releasing formulation that would enrich at local site endogenous FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. The other strategy that we've published is injecting a formulation that would release three separate things that would take an already prevalent population of um, naive immune cells and turn them into, transform them into uh, FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells at a, a local site. Um, so these are the collaborators that I've worked with and my students that worked on the two projects that I'm about to show you. Stephen Balmer, who's now a postdoc in dermatology and works between my group and Lufelo's group, uh, who's, who's pictured here. And then Jim Fisher, who did the transplant work that I'm going to show you a little later with uh, Vijay Garantla, who's now at Wake Forest, and Mario Solari, who's in plastics here at the University of Pittsburgh. And the two that I'm going to show you today are allergic contact dermatitis as an example of local inflammatory disease, which is cutaneous inflammatory response to allergens. You may be familiar with this if you've ever come brushed up upon a white oak uh, and, and you've ever uh, brushed up against poison ivy. Uh, you will have waited about a day and it becomes intensely itchy. It's called a pruitic rash that comes from this and it's a type four hypersensitivity response. Uh, likewise, we've also tried this in transplantation and I'll, I'll mention this next, but I'm gonna start with the use of this technology in allergic contact dermatitis. So if this pink area up here is the skin, you can imagine you have lots of antigen presenting cells in your skin. It's actually 17% of the surface of your skin are these um, roaming uh, uh, antigen presenting cells. And, and that makes sense because this is a primary entry point in your body for antigen. And if you were to expose it to an allergen like poison ivy, but in our case, we use two different of these uh, allergens called uh, DNFB and OXA. Uh, you'll see those uh, in the next several slides. That antigen presenting cell will come in and prime naive uh, uh, lymphocytes and, and basically differentiate them into effector T cells. And over that period of time, you'll get an allergic reaction to these things on your skin. What we were saying is that if we could take something like these uh, microspheres I described to you and induce regulatory T cells in the local site, that could potentially lead to differentiation into regulatory T cells instead of effector cells. You could potentially even get antigen tolerance. So we have a mouse model of this uh, with Lufalo in dermatology, you would paint something like DNFB on the ear, and you could treat at that same ear site, or you could treat at different sites in the mouse to see if you get an effect. Um, if DN DNFB paints the ear, uh, it's very potent, so you'll see the ears swell up and you'll get all kinds of inflammation. If it's not, then the ear stays and looks healthy. 
Here's just a cellular analysis of the treatment. The blue group is the treatment group uh, with the tri-microspheres. Uh, the orange is with uh, blank microspheres and painted ears. The red is just with painted ears. So what you see is uh, with the regulatory uh, T cell inducing treatments, you have a larger number of Treg at the draining lymph node um, than you would if you have blank microspheres or just uh, painted DNFB uh, um, ears. Then if you look at TH1, it's less, TC1, it's less. Um, and then if you look again at this key parameter, which is really important, the regulatory T cell to effector T cell ratio, that's higher in the treatment group, which is, which is what we would want to see with the same number of, of cells approximately in the year. So um, this is the timeline of treatment here. You would, in this case, prophylactically administer. So two days before you paint the ear, you would put in the microsphere formulations. You would sensitize that ear with the DNFB, and then you would challenge at this later time point. And at that challenge, that's when you would get this, this immune response in this particular uh, experimental setup. So what I'm showing here now are those results. This is just ear thickness. Uh, before I show you the, the chart, just look at the right-hand side. So you can see with a DNFB painted ear, you can see the, 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 the thickness of the ear. It swells up. There's lots of these lymphocytes in it. Um, and then if you treat that with the trimicrospheres two days before you sensitize, you can see that the ear doesn't really swell any more um, than a naive mouse. Okay. And then this is just the data showing what I described to you a few minutes ago over time. Now, if you go then and re-challenge later on, you see the same thing, uh, also suggesting that this works not only for a first challenge, but a, a second re-challenge. And um, when you analyze the um, FOXP3 to CD8 positive ratio in the local draining lymph nodes here under these circumstances, you can see why uh, it's not swelling, the ear is not swelling. The next thing that we looked at is, is would this act locally to generate systemic tolerance, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're actually going to administer the DNFB in this ear, and then we are going to treat using these microspheres. And what you would get um, in the ear draining lymph node, as we showed earlier, is a higher ratio of Treg to effector cells but when you monitor in the non-draining lymph node, not the, the ear draining lymph node, the non-draining lymph node, you also see an increased amount of Treg to effector cells, which makes sense. And if you administer the particles in a completely separate site, what you see is this doesn't work. So you would have to treat the same ear that you're painting with this haptin or this allergen, DNFB, in order to see this effect. Uh, both locally and systemically in the animal, which sort of makes sense based on the mechanism that I, of action that I described earlier. The other thing that we, we did here is, is look at um, injection in the abdomen and, and sensitization in the abdomen, and then challenge in the ear. So here what we're doing is we're sensitizing and treating in the same place and looking at a distal location for inflammation. Uh, so this would be kind of like you go out and you get an, a poison ivy infection uh, or uh, poison ivy exposure in one arm, and then later on over time, uh, you get exposed in your leg. So would this work in that circumstance? And what we see is it, is it does work in that circumstance. But what about other allergens? Not, is it specific to DNFB? We, we didn't think that it would be. Um, but we also looked at um, oxazolin, which is OXA that is here. And what you can see um, is that you get the same reduction in effect, which is what we would expect. Um, and we asked, is this allergen specific tolerance or is this some kind of non-specific anti-inflammatory effect? So how you could test that would be to sensitize with one thing, the oxazolin, and then later on check to see if it works for sensitization of DNFB. And what we find is it doesn't work. So when you locally treat with Treg enriching formulations, it produces regulation of antigen specific tolerance to oxazolin. And if you later then treat with DNFB, it is going to still swell. It only is not going to swell if you treat later with oxazolin. Now, what happens if someone is already sensitized? Will this work as a treatment rather than it prophylactically being administered? And, and we showed that that is also the case true. So if you um, add DNFB to the abdomen, and then uh, we actually added it twice here, and then you do a challenge at the left ear at the same time as you treat. 
with the trimicrospheres, you see a very low, again, response in delta ear thickness showing that, um, that you can use this as a treatment, not just prophylactically. Uh, we also showed that with a subsequent rechallenge, uh, that it also works in, in that regard to uh, treatment. And at this point in time, you're not treating with tried microspheres. That was treated earlier. So it still works later on after uh, a rechallenge. So a summary of, of these uh, studies, uh, we use these trimicrospheres that locally enrich the number of FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells, um, similarly to how a tolerogenic dendritic cell would do this, or um, you could imagine uh, that you could also enrich regulatory T cells if you mimicked what a tumor did. Um, that increases the Treg T effector ratio locally um, at the site in the draining lymph node. It works both prophylactically and therapeutically extends to multiple allergens, but it is antigen specific in terms of the allergen. It acts locally to generate systemic antigen specific tolerance. And what's really exciting about this is that if you understand uh, the immunology behind this, you're administering this haptin. This haptin is binding to proteins and it's creating hundreds of haptinated proteins that the immune system is reacting against. What's exciting is that this technology that's really mimetic is it's, is it's causing antigen specific tolerance to hundreds of these, uh, specifically hundreds of these hap haptinated epidermal antigens. And this was published in, in the journal of control release in 2017. The final example that I'm gonna give is a vascularized composite tissue allo transplantation. So this is um, Zion Harvey that you see in the bottom right hand corner. His body has rejected these hands eight times, and he has to stay on immunosuppressive protocols for the rest of his life. He's on three different things, FK uh, and, and also corticosteroids, um, for instance, also um, uh, low doses uh, of corticosteroids. So it's basically a triple immunosuppressive protocol that he has to stay on. That has many consequences systemically, can lead to cancer, infections uh, for the rest of, of this guy's life. Um, these composite tissue allografts are the most difficult transplants because you're, it, you're, you're transplanting skin, muscle, lymph. You're basically transplanting an entire immune system uh, onto another immune system in addition to the tissue. So they reject um, very reliably and very robustly. So what we did is we utilized a model uh, of this that uh, at plastic surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, they, they use. This is Yalchin um, Kalushi, who's now at Wake Forest, and he trained um, to do these uh, experiments here at the University of Pittsburgh. I have an entire another slide deck that I show on just the microsurgery related to this. And it's, I could never do this microsurgery. I really have to give these guys credit. It's remarkable how much skill it takes um, to basically uh, uh, transplant uh, the limb from a donor, uh, brown Norway mouse, to the body of a, a, a white Lewis recipient. We administer um, ALS induction therapy on day minus four and day one. We put in microparticle formulation injections on day zero and day 21. We apply FK506 immunosuppressive treatment from the beginning of this, and then we stop at day 21. This is because we wanted to uh, rule out the acute um, uh, inflammation and rejection symptoms and really look at the uh, long-term uh, adaptive rejection uh, that you see in these transplants in terms of treatment. And we place these microspheres all around the circumference of the transplant uh, when we did this. So this is what we look for over time. Here's the stages of rejection, uh, stage zero, two, uh, zero, 1, 2, 3, and 4, with 4 being necrosis and, and really the, the phrase they use is mummification of the limb over time. So it's a very pronounced effect. So what we're doing here is showing a percent survival over time and just survival curves with there being a jump in, in, in the graph a couple different parts. This is just what happens with uh, control animals where we remove the FK506 at um, a particular period of time and you can see the rapid rejection uh, of all of these animals that um, were transplanted and not treated with anything but the short, short uh, course of FK506. This is the group that was treated with the trimicrospheres over time. So all but one animal of 12 um, survived long-term out to 300 days. 
So if you can imagine if you're a student in an academic laboratory and your, your advisor tells you that he wants you to do a 300 day experiment with complex microsurgery at the beginning, uh, that's what um, my, my students were, were able to do. So I'm very proud of them for that. This is treatment with just the uh, rapamycin microspheres. This is treatment with just TGF-beta microspheres. This is treatment with just IL-2 microspheres. This is treatment with blank microspheres. And this is treatment with all three of the factors that we're controllably releasing from the site, but we're just injecting them bolus. So there is no local control release system to orient the factors and maintain them over time. So in that case, all of the animals reject as well. We also did an experiment to look and parse out the various factors here. So we did one with TGF-beta and rapamycin, TGF-beta and IL-2, and rapamycin and IL-2. And again, in vivo here, you can see that it works much better if you have all three of the factors that we um, engineered into the system. We also did contralateral uh, treatment, which is injection in the other limb, not the transplanted limb, and showed that uh, the results in that were, were poor um, as well. So let me introduce you to one of these guys. Um, my students call him Frankenstein. He's a white Lewis rat that has a brown Norway leg transplanted onto his body. He is on no systemic immunosuppression whatsoever. Uh, and he walks around with a transplanted brown Norway limb. He um, has not had the physical therapy that he would need in order to regain fine motor control of his uh, digits on his leg, but he can move the leg and stand on the leg and utilize it for support. Um, that's impressive, but what's even more impressive to me is the following slide, which demonstrates that when you look 300 days post transplant and you transplant the skin of the brown Norway mouse, which was the same skin that we used to transplant the original limb, that that is accepted immediately with no immunosuppression at all. In other words, this animal has learned to tolerate another animal's antigen. This is a complete from a completely mismatched rat. If you transplant a third haplotype, which was not the transplanted antigen from something like a Worcesterworth rat, you see that it rejects that uh, immediately. You no know, hair grows on it and, it and it sloughs off, okay? So this is antigen specific tolerance um, or in, in transplantation, it's called systemic dominant tolerance, which is um, uh, the highest standard that what we're going for in, in, in these transplants. Um, we did some mixed lymphocyte reactions to show how this works. If you're interested, I'll very briefly go through this. This was the, um, uh, the treated recipient mouse with a transplant, and this is just a naive mouse. You can take splenocytes from these mouth mice and then uh, isolate the lymphocytes, the CD4 positive lymphocytes, split them into effectors and Tregs on both sides. Um, these are your responder cells in this case. And then you can take a brown Norway uh, mouse uh, and, and use those as stimulator cells. And what you find in this case is that you have the same amount of proliferation. So we're not in any way with the trimicrosphere treatment like decreasing the amount of proliferation that you would expect to see if the Tregs are not there. Both T effector cells proliferate to the same amount. So check, that, that makes sense. Now, it, instead, if you take these effector T cells and stimulate with the brown no Norway donor, and you apply the T regs from this animal, or you apply the T regs from the tri MP treated recipient, what you see is a dramatic difference in suppression, with the tri MP T reg suppression being much higher, as you would expect, uh, than the naive T cell uh, uh, suppression, which is great. But if you take a third party Worcester rat here in this case, and you compare them to a Treg that is implanted with the naive um, affected T cells, what you see is, is a big difference. So you get much more suppression if you, in, in the case of the Brown Norway, you get almost no uh, suppression with um, the Worcester fur. So this is the um, mixed lymphocyte reaction version of the picture that I showed you with a skin transplant a little bit earlier. So this was the paper that was published um, on the uh, transplantation work that we did 
This one was with the Treg inducing particles um, that I described. And then we also have one for um, the recruitment of regulatory T cells that we've published in Science Ad Advances. The first was in PNAS, the second one was in, in Science Advances. We also have done work on other models and I didn't have time to talk about those today. Um, but we've done work in using these local treatments for uh, the treatment of periodontal disease. We've done that work in both um, mice and in canines, which is the best uh, translation model, preclinical large animal translation model. And we are currently scaling this up um, using GMP manufacturing through an NIH consortium uh, between uh, the University of Michigan, University of Pittsburgh, and the Wies Institute at uh, Harvard. We've also utilized these for treatment of dry eye disease. Interestingly enough, the etiology of both dry eye disease and periodontal disease is very similar where there's local tissue dysfunction as a result of immune imbalance. Um, and they work very effectively in at least murine models of, of uh, dry eye disease. And I should have mentioned, this is Andrew Gwacki who did the work um, uh, on, on the periodontal disease, who is now at Johnson & Johnson. And this is Michelle Rete, who did the work in Treg recruiting microspheres uh, for, uh, and also inducing microspheres for dry eye disease. Uh, she currently is working um, in regulatory consulting for the FDA. And we, although I was uh, hoping to have this out by the time I gave this talk, we, we uh, is still in review. If you're interested in all of these things, um, we just submitted a uh, invited review article to Advanced Drug Delivery Reviews where we go through these and many other different um, immune homeostatic induction, uh, immunoengineered vesicles uh, and, and control release systems. And this is a new student of mine, Elizabeth Bentley, who I expect uh, to do great things moving forward from the Department of Bioengineering. So just again, to finish uh, this talk by reintroducing the people who did this work, this is Sam Rostein, who did all of the work in engineering the, the local control release systems to do what we want them to do. And he is now the CEO of Chrono. This is Morgan Fedorchek, who did all of the work in the glaucoma releasing, uh, glaucoma drug releasing formulations. And she is now an assistant professor in ophthalmology, University of Pittsburgh, Sidra Nawala, uh, who did all of the work on the Treg recruiting microspheres, who is also a faculty member, um, he's in India. Xander Gawacki, who did all the work in the periodontal disease that I only briefly mentioned um, before, and he's at Johnson & Johnson. Jim Fisher, who did all of the, the work in um, the transplantation of, of limbs, and he is now a resident um, uh, in plastic surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is Stephen Ballmer, who's a postdoc uh, between Lou Velo and I in the Department of Dermatology, who did the work on um, type 4 hypersensitivity. To that, I'd just like to thank the funding that is specific to the work that I described to you um, earlier today. And I would be happy to take any questions that you guys have. And, and, and by the way, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, please follow us on Twitter. Like I, again, thank um, the Taras Tarasaki Institute and Ali and the leadership of the Institute for inviting me here to share my work with you. Uh, thank you for this great talk, Professor Little. A uh, couple questions came in. How do you envision long-term tolerance? How is timing selection involved in this mechanism? Okay, well, so I can't answer the question how thymic selection is involved in this mechanism. I mean, basically, um, you know, you have uh, lymphocytes that are available post thymus selection, I guess, right? That, that are available for rejection of any of these different antigens that you would put in your body, either the haptinated proteins or, you know, the entire proteome of, of, of a transplanted limb or organ. Um, what is going on with the regulatory T cells, and we see this with tumors, is that they are able to promote locally the tolerance, and this is happening locally in the, the, the local lymph node, tolerance of these specific antigens. And as I said before, tumors utilize this as a, as a very powerful immune evasion strategy. And many cancer treatments today are, are really oriented towards breaking that tolerance that tumors establish. Um, so far from what we've seen, the tolerance that we have induced is permanent. So we see the, the lack of rejection in our, in our limb transplants basically over a period of, of a couple months. 
but then these animals survive long term 300 you know basically 300 days they're, they're surviving and you can do transplants with these animals or um mlrs with these animals and uh they've permanently um accepted these antigens that were foreign but are not no longer um so that's the best i can answer do i know if this is going to work for 40 years in the life of a human being. I, I don't have that data yet. Okay. Uh, in VCA, HLA cross presentation can occur through donor exosomes being cross dressed onto recipient cells. Do you think that cross presentation that happened in the thymus can be partly involved in the tolerance? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, it, it could be. Um, we do not know locally what the specific immunologic mechanisms of uh, presentation are occurring. We just know that when you locally enrich a patient's own cells, that it can mediate the tolerance. We, we, don't, we don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Have you investigated the development of donor-specific antibodies in the scope of tolerance? No, not yet. We have not. We have not uh, investigated antibodies in our studies. Yeah. Do you have plans to develop strategies to influence and modulate BREG populations? BREGs, no, we don't. That, that's very interesting. Um, you know, the question would be, and I think that the, the strategies that we utilize here could be relevant to it. You could either imagine, or you could investigate in vivo, what are the things that produce or develop or induce BREGs? Right, and or you could look at what are the key factors that they respond to in terms of chemotaxis. So you could utilize these same strategies to do it. What I can't comment on is how powerful B regs would be alone in inducing this kind of response. They may be sufficient, um, but it may also be the case that you could uh, potentially even further or more powerfully induce if you were to recruit or induce both Tregs and Bregs. So it's a good idea, but we have not explored this. Do you think organ on a chip technology can help us study organ rejections? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we don't do a whole lot of organ on chip technology, but from what I've read about and understand about organ on a chip technology, it could help. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, the, the systems that better represents um, how that particular organ would communicate with local lymph nodes. Um, and, and understanding in that regard, in terms of how that's uh, communicating locally, uh, what are the antigens that are being presented? How are those antigens? And this goes to the, the earlier question that you, one of, the, the, um, uh, one of your audience members asked. Um, if you understood the immunology enough and represented it on that organ on a chip, then it, then it could. Um, we don't do organ on a chip technology, but I, from what I've seen, it seems very promising. Thanks. Um, are you using micro needles and other things to deliver uh, your formulations or how are you doing this? Great question. So in the studies that I showed today, we just subcutaneously inject or implant the, the microspheres. Um, you could, or, or in the case of, uh, the, the treatment to the eye, we embed them in a gel. Okay. And then it stays locally. Um, but we are currently working right now on some things with Lufalo that utilize micro, uh, micro needles, because you could easily imagine administering some of these treatments, for instance, for type four hypersensitivity or any other number of inflammatory skin diseases using microneedles to embed the microspheres um, uh, and, and get them, you know, through the dermis without causing pain or, or injections into the patient. So microneedles are a very promising administration strategy for that reason. It also could be the case that if you were trying to mediate rejection of uh, organs, that it may be better to utilize something like a microneedle array in order to place your, your formulations there, then it would be to inject into that organ. So for instance, like a heart, it may be smarter to, to do that than it would be to inject into the cardiac tissue. Uh, one final question came in. 
Natural physiological tolerance, EA pregnancy, also involves non-classical HLA-1, in particular HLA-G. Have you investigated the role of these molecules in your system with relationship to tolerance? No, again, an, an excellent question. And, you know, the, it's very interesting. It would be interesting to see, but we have not investigated those. That's a great question. Well, Professor Little, that's all the questions I have. I just want to thank you for your time and oh, you're welcome. answering the questions. Have a nice day, sir. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you.